Good morning, everyone. We're delighted that you're here. We have, we're kind of a late arriving crowd on Sunday mornings, and especially on Memorial Day, but we have a great crowd here with uh, our friends from uh, just, I would encourage all of you to stand and just greet one another. We, we'd like to be friendly, at least we could try So uh, in these days. So we, uh, we're, we're glad to have you all here, friends of our, our, our friends from Jessup. So uh, thank you. Take a moment. Oh, you can guys come on up. You can, you can be ready. Yeah. I, I'll, because that way I can introduce you and thank you for being here and all of that. So Caleb, thank you so much. Uh, we're glad that you're here this morning. We do welcome all, all, all of our, uh, our friends from Jessup that we, uh, Laura, Laura Johnson, our, our music director, connected with Caleb. I think it's Caleb, right? Right. So thank you so much for organizing this group uh, to be here for worship this morning. We are, we are glad to be in the house of the Lord. My Pastor Bob Ewell, uh, glad to have you all here. Uh, we also are wondering, too, uh, how we can connect all the way around, and we'll do that in a moment so we can hear. Uh, I, I, I know that might be embarrassing for you, but if you could just share your first name, we, could, we would love to. Yeah, would you? That would be awesome. I don't want to do that. That would be fantastic. I'm from Sacramento, California. Policy major. So public policy is political science, economics, the study on how to get or give a big headache if you live in Sacramento or Washington, <laughs> D.C. Uh, this is Jessica Dethridge. Jessica just finished halfway through her senior year, digital, uh, Department of Digital Communication and Design. Uh, this is McKenna Berry. She just finished her sophomore year, uh, major in... Uh, criminal justice and theater. How does how does that work together? I don't know. Um, just look at the Johnny Depp and Amber, Amber Heard trial, and you'll have some idea. Uh, this is Elizabeth McAfee. You are a Christian leadership major. Uh, she is the tech team leader for our William Justin University choir and orchestra. Uh, David McAnally who studies Christian leadership and music and uh, music education. Can you just finish your freshman year, right, David? Right on. Also finishing his sophomore year is Leon. Uh, Leon is a music major. And he's one heck of a percussionist. <laughs> uh, studying biology right behind me, finishing up his senior year this next semester is Nick Ballard. Um, if you need a guy who's a Star Wars nerd, uh, that is Nick. <laughs> um, and then the most important person to me in this room is my younger sister, Lydia, who will start going to William Jessup University this fall studying kinesiology. Yeah. But first, let's take a moment and let's pray. That's right. Father God, we love you so much, and we know that we all have stuff going on. We just thank you so much we can lay it at your feet, because you are the lion who fights for us, and you are the lamb who was slain for us. So we just worship you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, feel free to stand to your feet. Let's sing about the Lord.
So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Our God who comes to save is here to set the captive free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chain. as we sing about how God found us. And I searched the world But it couldn't fill me Hands and big praise And treasures that fail I never enough You came along Yes, you did. And you put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied. Nothing is 
get seated one of the things that we like to do at Celtic Cross is get connected a little bit so we have this question we'd love to ask someone who's not standing right next to you um, and that is this question what is something hard that you were able to do what was something hard that you were able to do so go ask somebody who's not right next to you If you're online with us today, I see you. Uh, I love that you're putting stuff in. What was something hard? I don't see many answers yet, but I'm sure you're going to put it in. When we do something hard, usually it takes a lot of focus and a lot of resilience. And CC Kids today, we're going to be talking about those two things. Uh, we're actually going to be talking about running the race. And running the race of life requires, one, focus on Jesus. And two, a lot of resilience because there's a lot of falling down. But God always helps us up and keeps us going. So if you are online and you want to check out what we were doing today in CC Kids, you can check out. Uh, there's a link on our web page. Same, probably the same place that this service was on. Uh, and if you are here in person, uh, I encourage you to 
come check us out afterwards at the picnic right over there. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. And if you didn't bring anything, do not worry about it. We have lots of extra stuff to let you hang out with us. And that'll start off at noon. So thanks for having us. And we'll see you a little later. One thing as we're running the uh, race with perseverance, it's, it's easy to forget um, how great God is. It's easy to focus on our troubles and our darkness. I know that if you were to ask anybody um, up on the stage or anybody in this room, we all have troubles. Uh, and we all have darkness in our lives. But we know that Jesus is the one who not only makes things beautiful, but also makes that darkness tremble. And so we can declare that about him because it's already true. He's already won your guys' battle. And all we're doing is just living, not yet seeing the aftermath of his victory but we're living in it. So let's sing about it.
darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus If silence fear Oh Jesus, Jesus You make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus Father God, we just lift you up We lift up your name You truly do make the darkness tremble You made the darkness tremble 2,000 years ago. And you're fighting our battles with us. And every knee will bow before you. And you're turning our mourning into dancing. Maybe we don't see it yet. But help us to not focus on our problems, but help us to trust you, Lord. Say in your word that we don't have to worry about anything. We can seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, and everything else will be taken care of. Help us not to dwell on yesterday. Help us not to worry about today. Help us not to worry about tomorrow, but help us to trust you in the present because you are worth it. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much uh, for your worship leadership. It is amazing to feel the experience of God through you. So thank you this morning for that. Would you uh, recognize them for their gift? They come back and do one more for us, I think. We're going to have them come back. It's even better. You know, in these days, we, uh, we're, we're troubled by lots of things. I was troubled to hear getting back from vacation. It was great to be on vacation, by the way. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, Patty and I made it safely to Italy and back no, without missing a whole bunch of different things, but uh, you, you, you catch up eventually. I'm not sure I'm caught up yet. But going back to what I was previously talking about and the experience that uh, we just had this morning for me, it's the experience of seeing youthful enthusiasm remind us of, of the tragedies of this life because they're real, and we all are aware of that. Uh, at least I believe that we all are aware of the tragedy that befalls all of us as we live in a place that is hard to explain and I'm not going to go into all the details of that but just to tell you that we have a God we have a God that we heard sung together about in this place that we worship and I am grateful for that experience I hope you are too would you join me as we join our hearts together in prayer Lord we know that uh, in these days we are overwhelmed Overwhelmed by experiences and tragedies and trauma that come from things that are outside our abilities to protect those that are the most vulnerable. But you, O oh Lord, remind us that you have the capacity to remind us that there is a power greater than that is what in the world. The evil that is in this world has no possible way because of you and what you've provided for us and you are trustworthy in every way this morning and so Lord as we speak into that and we hear the words of the psalmist that says we take refuge in you and we want to experience the words of Jesus even at his darkest moment call upon the power and presence of his relationship with his heavenly father Teach us, we pray, Lord, how to take refuge in you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It is a, a privilege to, uh, to come back and speak this morning, and I'm grateful for uh, opportunities to get away, to get resourced. Uh, as I shared with uh, the congregation before, Patty and I have never traveled internationally. We, uh, we've been to Mexico on many work, work projects. It uh, doesn't always feel like that when you just drive across a border or go to Canada, right? But when you travel to a faraway land, it's kind of like it reminds you of the connectedness of the human part of us. We're all connected. And I know I'm in the middle of a series, but... Um, this series about the attributes of God speaks to us in this day because some people don't trust God. They don't trust in a God whom we know if we know him. And I want to encourage us to look at that this morning. Now, in this series, we've talked about God's sufficiency and the work that he's doing in us. Uh, we talked about the blacksmith who turns the... Uh, 
the, the steel into strength by firing and refiring and retesting and folding it over and changing the connections of the molecular structure of the steel over and over again by pounding on it. And it feels like life isn't always uh, there for us. But it is much more than that, as God is good to everyone, according to the psalmist. Uh, the psalmist reminds us that the compassion comes and is for all creation, not just a few, but for all. How do we experience that? Well, as Tozer says, A.W. Tozer, the theologian who's been most helpful for that, is pretty typically what comes uh, into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So whatever you're thinking about this morning about God is, is, you know, maybe you've got a long list. I was talking to a few of the students ahead of time. They're looking for jobs. I know what they're thinking about. That's reality, right? You, whatever it is, whether you have something at work or whether you have something in your relationship, something else, it has, us, has a way of us thinking about who is God. But Tozer's right about this. What we think matters, and how we think about it matters as well. And I want to just show you a picture of a great basilica. This is in Florence. Florence is, is an incredible place. We spent an, uh, some, some days there. Uh, in fact, Patty and I climbed to the top of the, the, the dome there. At the very top, there's actually a place that comes outside, and you can see for miles and miles, or as in Italian, it's kilometers, I know. But what's more incredible is what's inside, because inside that dome, is a, uh, there's frescoes at the top that are pictures, and you can barely see them from the bottom, because it's this tall building that stands out in the middle of this place. It was built, uh, the Cathedral of San, Santa Maria de Fora it was, was built uh, to the glory of God a long time ago with a lot of marble. I mean, we're talking about, uh, you know, a, a, gorgeous structure and it kind of just sticks up in the middle of nowhere in the middle of town and it's got this huge bell tower with it it's got a baptistry we, we, you know you, you go into those places and we didn't spend a lot of time in those places because they're empty there are actually museums which is kind of a sad story yet at the other end of that because we did spend time in Rome and got to see all that. And I would just say to any young person that's here today, go when you're young. Don't wait till you're old like me. That's not. You want to go when you have energy and you can walk and you can do all the things and see all the things. But what is so most striking is the 400 steps that go in. If you're claustrophobic, don't do it. <laughs> you, you go up the middle of that thing to get to the top. That's, there's no elevator. There's no lift. There's no other way to go. You go to the top, which is about a 20-minute hike up these stairs, but it's so much worth it. It's sort of like life. It's worth it when you get to the top to see the, the values that are there. But what struck me the most is the 17-foot high devil. It's like, we don't talk about evil, but evil was such a part of the story of the five layers, and I'm not going to show you any more pictures because that would be boring, and I don't need to bore you because I fell asleep in art history class too. Uh, it, it, it is amazing how much history is there, but the 17 foot frescoes on the sides of the walls, and you actually, if you can see the railing there, that actually you walk there, so you can see it, you can feel it. And the fear of the frescoes is, in my mind, the fact that this is the great, this is Revelation 21. The, the, the artist rendered Revelation 21. This is the end, where everybody gets back what they're going to get back. And it's huge. I'm thinking, we don't talk about it that way. But evil is present in our world. And as I just prayed about the tragedies of our world, we see it, we experience it, we know it. And for those that are so close to it, it's so heart-rendering. And we pray for those who have the power to make decisions that might change things. But on the other hand, this is kind of like life. I mean, these frescoes have been here for hundreds of years. And they're still telling a story for hundreds of years. And I think as we think about all of this, I just want to kind of just take time this morning to tell you that God can handle anything, and especially our complaints. 
And if you don't think God is the complaint department, then I want to give you that, that opportunity this morning to say, you should be able to take everything you want to, to God. I remember Dallas Willard sitting in a class, and I was, I was listening to him talk. He just said, some of you spend way too much time telling your most significant other all the troubles of your life, and you just wear them out. He goes, he would look straight at us and said, don't do that. Don't do that. He said, tell God. He can handle it a whole lot better. And he's right. It reminds us that we have a place that we can take our complaints, and he can handle it. God can handle our complaints. Uh, the psalmist says this, our people trust in him at all times. And, and here's the psalmist crying out. And, and Jesus, I believe, I'm going to speak to the Garden of Gethsemane scene this morning in Mark chapter 14. I believe Jesus was thinking about this psalm. I don't know why I think that. I, just as I've been reading this psalm over and over again, I'm going, I think Jesus, as we know, was very familiar with the prayers the Hebrew prayer book. And he would have known this psalm, oh, my people, trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart to him, for God is our refuge. And it was there in the Garden of Gethsemane after Jesus had had these great experiences with his own disciples, and then he also knew at the same time that he would be betrayed, right? He, we knew that. Judas is there at the table with them when he shares that the table uh, the Last Supper, he's all, all of this is happening. Then he goes out into the garden, according to the text of Mark chapter 14. And we see that Jesus is praying. He went to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here for a while. I'm going to pray. And we think about this for just a moment. I, I go on and we see that Jesus took Peter, James, and John. I've told the congregation this a number of times that it's these three are in Jesus' uh, small group. <laughs> They're literally his small group. He brings them in, and I'm always reminded that um, more is caught than taught by the way Jesus operated. He just brought people into his life and said, look at what I am doing, and then do it. And then what we find, Mark saying, is he became deeply troubled and distressed. At that point, I think it's that reality of his only place he could go here is to back to his relationship with God. And Jesus told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Wait. But you know, I'm not good at waiting. I don't know if you're good at waiting, but... Jesus sometimes tells us to wait. To wait and the second W will be watched. To wait and watch is really what Jesus is telling us in this world because people are watching us. Just as Peter, James, and John would go on to do what they did, they did it because they had been so close to Jesus, they could see what he was experiencing in that last few hours. What would happen? Jesus put that on them, to wait and to watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. You know, the body doesn't always do the connection with the spirit. There is this connection. And I like the way that Mark puts it here for us so that we could see that it is true, the temptations of the world is to say, well, you know, God's not really involved in any of these. yes. He is, and here's why. When we wait and we watch, we have an opportunity to give back a witness, a witness of faith, a witness of reality, of saying, oh, no, it's not because we're perfect, because no one is, but it's because we have an experience to share, something deep in our hearts, just as the psalmist said, what's in the heart? Take refuge in God, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Do you know the story goes on that the disciples fell asleep, right? You know that part of the story. They fell asleep, and Jesus wasn't too happy with them because, oh, they were waiting, but they fell asleep. 
They didn't know what to do. I think sometimes we just fall asleep, not intentionally. We just are overwhelmed by maybe physical tiredness. Maybe, maybe there's some other distraction. Maybe, maybe it's just we don't have what Jesus is asking us to have is to be in connection with his spirit and say, oh, I understand. I need to wait and watch. And then secondly, I would say the text here in Mark just reminds us we can be honest. If we can take all of our complaints to God, if he truly is where we can take everything, then we have this relationship, which is so curious here where Mark just inserts an Aramaic word, which Jesus was fluent in because he had learned all of that. And we see it here in this word, Abba, Father. He's talking to his heavenly Father in a personal way. Everything is possible for you. He knew it wasn't possible in him. He was now revealing, here's what's, here's what's caught. Here's what's caught. He got caught. Everything is possible because he had a relationship, a passionate relationship, an honest relationship. Now, we learn something from this word, uh, Abba. It means father in Aramaic. But it's also a term of, 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 of closeness, of endearment. Uh, in fact, uh, it's an affectionate, dependent thing that where you could even use the term daddy or papa. That's how close Jesus was to his heavenly father. It was this closeness, this understanding of how Jesus knew the will of the father. As we see it revealed, he says this, he take this cup of suffering away from me. Jesus didn't want to suffer, but he knew he would need to, right? Yes, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And here's the point. When we wait and we watch, we actually see the will of God revealed. When we wait upon God. We don't try to insert our own ideas. We're waiting on God to reveal it to us. And I am an impatient person by nature. And the spirit may be willing, but the body is weak, and I need help. And Jesus said, just trust me. Be honest about what things that you're seeing and not seeing. Can you cry out in your prayers and just say, I don't understand why these things are happening. And then I can take refuge in with the answers we find. Yet I want your will, not mine, Jesus said. And he knew at that moment what would that would take. He would have to go out. He would be actually... Uh, forsaken by Judas at that point, and then he was taken for the six illegal trials, which I'm not going into this morning, but I'm just going to say, Jesus knew all that was going to happen, and he didn't get impatient. He just waited, and he kept watch, and he was honest with his feelings, yet not my will, but yours. And in that, we can see that it's the heart of Jesus that was caught by Peter, James, and John, who were the three closest, according to the text that we saw. They were the closest. They could see it, and it changed their lives. It changed their lives in ways that made them think, oh, there's something else here. There's something else of the resiliency of people. Patty and I got to take a trip to a national park in Italy. We, I had never heard of it. I, we did some research. She really wanted to do this experience. And this, uh, I don't say it correctly, so if you like the correct pronunciation, you can check in with Patty and make sure I get it. Cintier is, is what I, the best I can do, but it's not right. So don't listen to me. But I will tell you this about these resilient people that lived in these five villages. These five villages on the shores of Italy were never conquered by the Romans. The Romans could never get to them. They built little homes like this, actually big homes. They just stacked them up, and then they painted them some really pretty colors, so it makes it really cool pictures. Actually, I took a picture. That's my picture. I'm not take credit for one thing this morning. Is that one picture I can do? And what's so stunning about the place is the fact that these people were so resilient for thousands of years. They created their own food source. In fact, part of, the, was, part of the experience was to take a hike. So for two or three miles, you could walk where they walked and see where they farmed. If you can't see in the picture, I'll just tell you that this terraced 
farming. They took the side of the hill and they created enough space to grow their own food. They had their own wine. They had their own food sources. They, had, they grew their own and had their own animals. They had everything to, to fight against the people that were trying to overtake them. But what's most interesting to me that caught my eye in my ear, because my eye and ear don't always connect, but I did catch this. All these rock terraces are uniquely built. Now, I come from an agricultural family, so it's always interesting. The water from the top comes down, and the rock walls allow the water to penetrate and, and water the things going down the hill. Does that make sense? It's all rock. You can, there actually is a train that goes all, connects all five cities. They build, board a hole, and you can get there by train to the boat on the way back. But what is so interesting is that all the rock that's been taken and played in those walls is greater than all the stones in the Great Wall of China. That's a lot of stones. That's a lot of rock. That's a lot of stuff, right? I mean, the resiliency of the people. And then what strikes me in all of this is that's our call. Our hearts, our hearts are called to stay resilient to the faith that we sing about and that is passionately coming through, that we never give up. They never gave up. Living in a, gosh, a harsh environment, but they made it work because they cared about each other. And these towns are very tiny now. They're, not, they're no, nothing over a 1,000 people. But when you see the resiliency of the people, it reminds me of John's letter to the churches. And I've told our congregation, some of you know too, that uh, John was the latest of all of our apostles. He had lived through so many experiences. And for John, it all comes back to how you live, which is why the letters of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, they're so helpful to us because they all focus on what's our message? And of course, if you know anything about 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, it's all about love. How do you love people? And Eugene Peterson's The Message, the paraphrase, he says this, just look at it. We're called the children of God. That's who we really are. But that's also why the world doesn't recognize us or even take us seriously because it has no idea who he is and what he's up to. No one knows who God is. That's really the reality of this world. And it's the resilient people that hang in there, that never give up, that come up with ways to say, I understand the ways of the heart. There's something deeper inside that gives me something to hang on to. That's what Jesus revealed in the garden, the passionate heart. That's what Peter, James, and John recognized. They said, uh-oh, we see it. Jesus is in step with his heavenly Father, and is never going to give up. And he builds us up. But just like as these pictures tell the, the stories of people who are willing to do whatever it takes to rely on each other, to never give up, but to love, to love people just as they've been loved. Lord, we thank you for your word that inspires us to never give up. And we are always overwhelmed, Lord, by the fact that you're with us. Whatever journey, whatever place that we have been on, you are with us. And Lord, we're so grateful that we have opportunities to show the world who we really are. We have a passion. We have a heart that's been changed by you and your spirit. You've changed us. You've changed us inside out. You've done something that we understand. And Lord, we know there's challenges, but we also know that when we wait upon you, you reveal yourself to us. So Lord, reveal your will to us as we wait upon you. For we know that your message of hope lives through us when we trust your spirit in all things. Lord, help us, we pray. We give you glory, honor, and pray. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we...
isso por hoje. so much and I understand you'll be back next week is that right oh, yeah. oh, well, well, well we'll take it we were glad to have a few of you back next week such great energy in the room it's so great to have you here today may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord lift up his counts upon you and give you his peace both now and forevermore amen
between us By the cross you came and broke them down You broke them down and There were chains around us By your grace we are no longer bound No longer bound You called me out of the grave You called me into the light You called my name and then my heart came alive your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. So fear the dark. Shaking, all the dead are coming back to life. Oh, back to life. I hear the song awaking, all creation singing. We were alive, cause you're alive. You called me out of the grave, you called me into the light. You called my name, and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Oh, and what a oh, love we found, death can hold us down, shout it out. Darkness, you're the fire 